Hey, folks, and thanks for joining us. Welcome aboard to uh, our first of our April webinar series with Logan University. Uh, my name is Logan, uh, no relation, and I'm joined here by Michael and Jeremy of Logan U, who are uh, based in the States. They're going to talk a little bit about health sciences, Cairo, and uh, studying south of the Canadian border, as it were. Um, so thanks so much for your time, gentlemen. Uh, I'll pass it to you, Michael, if you want to get us started. OK, thanks, Logan. So again, good afternoon. Thank you again for taking the time to join. Again, my name is Mike Lynch uh, with Logan University. So my title, I'm what we call the Executive External Relations Officer. So basically what I do uh, for the universities, I kind of travel around the United States. I go to Canada, go to Puerto Rico, and I talk to undergrad students and sometimes high school students about um, Logan, um, the major programs that we offer, the big one being a doctor of chiropractic program. Um, and then we're also joined by Jeremy Boyce, who's the assistant director of admissions at Logan. He works with the uh, international applicants. So um, we thought, again, having two of us present would be uh, really beneficial. So we're here to, you know, primarily or basically answer any questions you might have. I do have a a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to walk through as well. Um, talk a little bit about chiropractic, um, just kind of some background on the profession and then uh, some information about Logan. And we can talk a little bit again about some of the uh, different scholarship opportunities we have and that type of thing. So as I said, um, if you do have any questions as we go through this, please feel free to drop them in the chat box and uh, we'll address those at that point. So Jeremy, is there anything you'd like to like to say before we start the PowerPoint? Oh, not, not, not at all. I appreciate you. I appreciate the introduction. But as Michael said, I will be the student that, I mean, not the student, I will be the uh, admissions coordinator that you all will be working with the moment you decide that you want to pursue chiropractic. So uh, I am the, the on-campus, um, I guess you can say, liaison to get you here and, and work with you on getting all the documents, which we'll probably talk about in just a second here. So thank you all for joining and well, we we look forward to to hopefully meeting you here. Right, thank you. Okay, so just give me a second. I want to share my screen with everybody. Hopefully, you can all see that. Um, so just a little bit of background on Logan. So as I mentioned, Logan is known primarily as a chiropractic institution. Uh, we're actually located down in Chesterfield, Missouri, which is a suburb of St. Louis, um, considered the Midwest of the United States. Um, we are about 20 to 25 minutes from downtown St. Louis. Um, and as I said, kind of a PowerPoint that we're going to walk through. And there, there's, if we have the time, I don't know if we'll get to all of this, but there's kind of four topic areas that we typically will kind of talk about. Um, the first being, you know, again, kind of a definition of chiropractic and how chiropractors are trained. Uh, talk a little bit about maybe some of the career opportunities within the profession. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Logan as well, because in addition to the chiropractic program, we do offer some other master's degrees and doctorate degrees um, that are typically good complements for chiropractic. And then we can also talk a little bit um, kind of about the admissions process, um, which some of you may have questions with kind of how that works and, you know, good times to apply, scholarship opportunities, things like that. So I think a good place to start just to kind of give everybody kind of get everybody on the same page um, to talk a little bit about the profession. Um, and I, I think a good place to start is almost kind of with the definition. So when somebody graduates from a chiropractic program, the credential they receive is a doctor of chiropractic. You see in parentheses DC. So like with a medical doctor, you see MD after their name. With a chiropractor, you see DC. One of the things with a profession that some Times people don't understand is that doctors of chiropractic go to consider portal of entry healthcare professionals. So what that means is this. As a doctor of chiropractic, you can kind of see patients that come and see you off the street. So you do not need a referral from a primary care physician. What they're going to do is a physical exam, come up with a diagnosis, a treatment plan, and then they're going to provide the care. So they kind of see their patients for the minute they come in the door until they're done with care. So as it says here, basically what chiropractors do is they diagnose and treat disorders of what's termed the musculoskeletal nervous system. So they kind of focus on three things, which is muscle, bone, and nerve. So if you can just kind of think about your bodies for a second, kind of focus it on your backs. You know, obviously we all have vertebrae. They're kind of stacked on top of each other. Then between the vertebrae, you have disc. 
the spinal cord runs down through the vertebrae and then the nerves run off the spinal cord to different areas of your body. So what will happen is the vertebrae can actually become misaligned. And when that happens, what it then does, it impinges on a nerve which can create pain that can then radiate. So it might go down, let's say, the back of your legs in the form of something like sciatica. You may have low back, mid back, upper back, even up into the neck of the cervical area in the form of a headache. So what the chiropractor is looking to do using their hands is to manipulate or adjust the vertebrae to get them back in alignment because now when that happens, it's not impinging on the nerve. The person should no longer be in pain. So you see the term non-invasive methods. One of the things with a profession, and this is true within all of healthcare, there's something called scope of practice. And basically what that means is a healthcare practitioner, it's what you're kind of allowed to do within your area of specialty. So chiropractors use what are called non-invasive methods. Okay, like we said, pretty much they use their hands, different chiropractic techniques. However, there's two things they do not do. They do not prescribe medication, and then they don't do any kind of cutting of the skin. So they don't do things like injections, immunization, suturing, things of that nature. So as it says here, they treat using traditional diagnostic method. That's the physical exam. And then they'll use a, a variety of chiropractic techniques and involve manipulation or adjustment, not only the spine, but also your extremities. So pretty much any joint in your body can be adjusted. So anything from your toes, your ankles, your knees, your hips, your fingers, wrists, elbows, and shoulders can all be adjusted or manipulated. So what a chiropractor does, they perform what's called a high velocity, low amplitude thrust, which is known as an adjustment. But in addition to that, they do quite a bit of patient education. You almost have to look at the profession from two perspectives, kind of short term and long term. In the short term, typically what a chiropractor is looking to do is to get a patient out of pain because 99% of the time, that's the reason that they're there. But more long term, what they're really looking and hoping to do is to keep people out of pain. But the problem is, as human beings are kind of creatures of habit, and we kind of do things repetitively, even if they're not necessarily good for us. So you see like the word exercise here. So typically when somebody has an adjustment done, especially when it's concerning their low back, uh, the chiropractor will then give them some stretches and some exercises that they can do maybe to strengthen the core, which could take some stress off your low back. You see the word nutrition, you know, obviously what we put into our bodies has an impact on our health. So they may have conversations with a patient about their diet, you know, things they're eating, things they're not eating, or things maybe add to your diet or take out of your diet. You know, there's supplements you might be able to take, even something as simple as hydration or drinking enough water each day to stay hydrated. So like I said, sometimes you'll hear the profession almost referred to as kind of a whole body approach, because again, what they really are trying to do with their patient more in that long term uh, period is to get them to think about their overall health and things that they can do maybe to help themselves stay out of pain. OK, I'm going to skip over this one. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about kind of what we call goals of a chiropractic adjustment. And there's kind of four things that I've listed here. And we talked a little bit about the first one, which is to reduce pain. Back pain is actually the number one reason why people, most people go see a medical doctor. Uh, number one is a common cold. Number two is back pain. Correct musculoskeletal function, as it says here, to restore normal function in the nervous system. So like we said a minute ago, if the vertebrae is in alignment, it's not impinging on a nerve person should not be in pain. And th what that does allows the nervous system to function the way it should. The third one, improve range of motion. This one, if you look at it kind of like from an athletic perspective, kind of makes sense because if you think about it, most sports involve using your, you know, your legs, your low back, your trunk. And if you happen to have a tight low back, chances are you're going to be in pain could impact your gait, could impact your performance. So what you're finding today is pretty much every professional sports team is using chiropractic in some capacity. Uh, a lot of uh, colleges and universities do, high school athletes do as well. Um, so it's really started to integrate itself within kind of that athletic arena. And then also produce an overall feeling of well-being. So there are people that go see a chiropractor, what's called wellness care. They kind of go periodically to get adjusted. It's just kind of part of a person's overall healthcare routine. So as I mentioned a minute ago, um, chiropractors, they primarily use a hand to treat their patients. And there are many different chiropractic techniques they can utilize. And in many cases, they might utilize a specific technique based on some certain conditions, like maybe the age of the patient, uh, the condition they're presenting with, maybe the amount of pain that they're in. But in addition to the chiropractic techniques, there's other modalities that they're trained to utilize. And I've listed some things here. So things like traction therapy, therapeutic exercises, laser light therapy, 
uh, manual therapies. There are some chiropractic techniques that are a little bit more massage based. And then you see the things like tens and hot and cold packs. So this is one of the beauties of the profession that will tend to track people as practitioners is that you tend to have a lot of flexibility when it comes to treating your patients. Like I said, different chiropractic techniques you can utilize different modalities. And in most cases, or I should say many cases, um, when somebody goes to see a chiropractor before they have an adjustment done, usually one of these modalities is also incorporated. Because again, like we said, in the long term, short term, um, really looking to help to help that patient get out of pain. And like we said, more long term help that person stay out of pain. Okay, so I'm going to uh, transition to the next section. Uh, typically, if I was doing this in person, I'd stop and ask for questions, but since we have the chat box, I'll kind of keep going. So I understand a lot of you are international. However, one of the things that you need to be aware of, um, and again, if it's great if you're interested in chiropractic, but if you're looking at other healthcare disciplines, um, is you making decisions to go on to school, you know, one of the things you kind of need to be aware of is what is the average salary, you know, for the profession that I'm interested in. So this is U.S. salary, but it's pretty similar across the globe. But here in the United States, the average salary for a chiropractor um, as of 2023 is just over $162,000 a year. Okay, and I got this from salaries.com. I kind of update this every year. Uh, but as I said, as you start kind of narrowing in on different uh, careers you might be thinking about, also do research on average salary because like here in the United States, for example, your salary can actually vary from state to state. And one of the reasons for that is insurance reimbursement because it's not all the same. So you might find, let's say here in the United like I, I live in New York State, Jeremy's in Missouri. Um, if you were to compare Missouri and New York when it came to chiropractic services, Missouri is a much better state to practice in than New York. Reimbursement on the insurance side is better, scope of practice is better. So, you know, we kind of try to advise our students, you know, if you are looking at chiropractic, um, you know, depending on the state that you're from, if it's a place you want to go back to, know what the scope of practice rules are, know what the average salary is. Um, and if you're looking to go to another state or potentially another country, we have a lot of students that come to Logan from Canada and the idea they want to go back to Canada. So these are just some, some things you need to be aware of, um, you know, as you're looking at a career, because obviously, you know, you want to be something in something that you're passionate about, but also one you'd be satisfied with when it comes from a kind of income perspective. And then again, here in the United States, but this is kind of true globally, um, the outlook for the profession is very good. Utilization of chiropractic services by the general public has been growing for the last 10 or 15 years, and that's actually expected to continue. And one of the big reasons for this, I think, is the internet, because we just have so much more information available to us today. So let's say, for example, somebody suffering from low back pain, and you were to go into Google and say, what are my treatment options? You're going to see things like chiropractic care, maybe acupuncture, massage therapy, oriental medicine, those type of things. So this has been a good thing for chiropractic because they're treating patients today that they weren't seeing 15 or 20 years ago, either because people maybe didn't understand what a chiropractor did or just didn't even know if they existed. So again, this is not again this focus a little bit more on the U.S., but this is relevant, uh, you know, across the globe. Um, if you do decide you're going to pursue a career in healthcare, so maybe I'm become a chiropractor, I'm become a medical doctor, you're going to become a dentist, uh, physical therapist, whatever it might be. One of the things you're going to have to do is carry malpractice insurance, and what this does, it kind of protects you as a practitioner from being sued by a patient. So the dollar amounts I have here, again, U.S. dollars, these are kind of national averages, but a physician pays somewhere in the area around ten to twenty thousand dollars a year in malpractice insurance. However, as you get into specialties, you can pay more. So a surgeon is going to pay more than a surgery can be kind of risky. Um, and so the reason I bring that up is if you look at malpractice insurance for a chiropractor, it's about $1,500 a year. But again, this can vary from state to state. So where Jeremy is in Missouri, malpractice insurance for a chiropractor is about $1,500 to $1,800 a year. Here in New York State, it's about $3,000 per year. So again, it's a little bit more expensive to practice, let's say, in New York than Missouri. But overall, it's relatively inexpensive. And one of the big reasons for this is chiropractic care is very, very safe. It's very conservative. Like I said earlier, pretty much they're using their hands to treat their patients. So they're not cutting the skin open. Uh, you know, they're not prescribing medication. So there's a lot they can do to a, uh, to a patient to harm them that will cause them to be sued. 
if they were being sued more often, or sometimes, you know, you'll see in the news, like these large malpractice settlements, if that were happening within their profession, the malpractice insurance would be much higher because these rates, they're all set by insurance companies and it's all based on risk. So they look at chiropractic as a low risk option compared to some of the other things that are out there. So again, you know, depending the direction you end up going with your career choice, you know, if you are going to go into healthcare, do some research on what the malpractice would be in that particular profession. And then again, there's a growing demand for non-invasive care. Again, people are starting to figure out they don't necessarily have to have surgery or take medication. There's kind of other treatment options available. And then this is pretty interesting. Um, doctors of chiropractic have an 83% patient satisfaction rate. It's the highest of any healthcare profession. This one, if you think about it, kind of makes sense because most people, you know, when they go to see a chiropractor, like we said a few minutes ago, they're in pain. And more times than not, when they leave, they're either out of pain or in a lot less pain than they went in. So it kind of feeds into this wellness model we were talking about earlier. Because there are some studies that have shown that once somebody receives chiropractic care for the first time, it's something they'd like to continue with even if they do it on a wellness basis. And you can see here the profession is made, again, this is kind of focused on the U.S., but it's been named to some different lists. But chiropractic in general, it's a very, very satisfying career from a practitioner standpoint because you know, what a many, and my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law's chiropractor, and one of the reasons that he was attracted to the profession was that he said there's no better feeling than helping to get somebody out of pain, um, which is why you tend to see chiropractic rank very highly in some of these lists and that type of thing, because of the, not only the patient satisfaction, but the practitioner satisfaction as well. And then just to give you an idea as far as like employment opportunities, um, and this is an area that's grown within the profession that's grown quite a bit. Um, I've been involved with chiropractic education now for about 26 years. And when I first got in this years ago, there were basically two paths a new graduate would take. One would be private practice, which some people still do, so they come out of school and open their own practice. But what most new graduates do work is what's called an associate. So in this case, what an associate is, it's a licensed doctor of chiropractic is actually an employee. So they might be working for another chiropractor in their practice, maybe working in a hospital setting, you know, maybe with a sports team or multidisciplinary setting. But a lot of new graduates actually like to go this direction because it gives them a chance to kind of learn about the profession more from the business side. OK, um, if you talk to people that go into healthcare. Oh, two, overwhelmingly, the two big reasons they tell you they want to do it. Number one, like we said, they want to help people feel better. But secondly, a lot of them want to be their own boss, maybe run their own practice or run their own clinic. But they don't necessarily have the confidence to do that coming right out of school. So they'll work as an associate and then transition into a private practice. Um, hospital settings, these are becoming a lot more prevalent. I just mentioned my brother-in-law a minute ago. So he graduated from chiropractic school in 2002. And then he worked as an associate for a chiropractor up in Massachusetts for a couple of years. And then he moved down to Plymouth, Massachusetts and opened his own practice. Um, he was in private practice for three years and the hospital in Plymouth wanted to bring chiropractic services. And so they actually approached him. They bought his practice and hired him at the hospital. And he's currently chief of staff for their pain management center. Uh, the sports teams, this is another area within the profession that's grown really quickly. We tend to have a lot of students that want to come into our program. They're kind of former athletes, and they kind of almost look at that as a potential patient base they may want to treat when they're in practice. So one of the um, kind of advantages that we have being in St. Louis is we have affiliations with some of the professional sports teams and a, a couple um, fairly large universities in the Midwest. Where we actually will provide care, chiropractic care, to these patients. So if we have students that want to kind of work with some of these high level athletes before they even graduate, they have the chance to do that. So when they graduate, maybe they want to apply for a job with, like I said, a professional sports team or a college or university, they can show they have some clinical experience on the resume. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the multidisciplinary setting, this is where you may have, let's say a chiropractor, maybe physical therapist, orthopedic doctor kind of in practice together. Because what you're starting to see today is an increase in what's called integrative or collaborative care, where these healthcare professionals are kind of referring patients back and forth to each other. So as I said earlier, this has been a really good thing for the chiropractic profession because they are starting to treat patients that they weren't seeing years ago. But just as importantly, what this also does, it gives the chiropractors the ability to kind of educate other healthcare practitioners about what they do. In, in fact, my brother-in-law, I remember him telling me a few years ago when he first started at the hospital, a couple of orthopedic doctors were kind of apprehensive to work with him because they didn't really understand what he did. But when it came to the neuromusculoskeletal issues, they, they realized pretty quickly he knew way more than they did because here's something interesting. 
most medical doctors are not trained to deal with back pain, which is why a lot of cases, what they do with patients is either writing prescriptions or maybe send them out for surgical consultations. But what's interesting and what's starting to happen today is a lot of medical schools are starting to teach their medical students about spinal manipulation. They're not teaching them how to do it, but they're teaching them about it. So when they're in practice and let's say somebody comes in with back pain, the thought is, you know what, let's start with chiropractic care first. It's safe, it's conservative. If it works, great. If not, we can try another option. Um, and then the teaching and research, this is another area where, you know, sometimes people will graduate from a chiropractic program instead of focusing on patient care, decide they want to teach or do chiropractic research. All righty. So let me just take in Jeremy, if there's any point that you want to jump in, feel free. Um, but let me just take a couple of minutes to talk about Logan specifically. As I said earlier, we're located down in Chesterfield, Missouri. Um, we're one of, I think there's 18 accredited chiropractic programs now between the United States and Canada. Uh, we do have a 112 acre campus. It's actually named one of America's most beautiful campuses by MSNBC. Um, we did make a list a couple of years ago from the Business Journal, one of the 25 fastest growing universities um, of a study they did of about 1500 schools. Doesn't necessarily mean the biggest, but um, we've added some academic programs. Our chiropractic program has grown, which kind of put us on the list. And also, uh, Logan, we have an 87% graduation rate, which is outstanding. Um, again, one of the things you want to consider if you're looking at graduate or professional school is uh, what is the graduation rate? You know, if you're still in the high school, you're looking for a college or university. Again, graduation rate is very important because obviously it gives you uh, the higher the graduation rate, the higher the likelihood you're going to graduate from that school. The other thing to be aware of is this. If you do go into healthcare or patient care, one of the things you're going to have to do more than likely is pass a board exam because a lot of these professions are licensed healthcare professions. So chiropractic is a licensed healthcare profession. So in order to practice, you actually have to do a couple of things. You have to graduate from an accredited school, which Logan is, but just as importantly, you're gonna have to be able to take and pass a four-part national board exam. And um, again, from country to country, if you're from Canada, you, it's the same process. You have to take a board exam as well. Um, and again, we have students that come to Logan from Canada that will go back to Canada and take the Canadian boards and they're they're very prepared. So that usually isn't an issue. But what you're going to want to do is look for programs that have high board passage rates. So if you were to look at within the chiropractic world, if you look at Logan's performance on the national boards, I think we rank second overall in board passage rate. Almost 90% of our students pass the boards the first time they take them, which is very, very good. So, and the way it works in chiropractic is you take a four part national board exam and you actually take that while you're in school. So, by the time you graduate, most of our students obviously have their degree and have taken and passed the boards. And then at that point, with again, it's kind of a decision they have to make, which is where might I want to practice? So, the way it works here in the United States, for example, is if you want to go to a specific state, like where Jeremy is in Missouri, I am in New York, you have to take what's called the jurisprudence exam. And it, what that is basically is a healthcare laws for that specific state. You pass that, you have your license to practice in that state. And that's kind of how it works here in the United States. Canada is kind of the same way. Um, I think they have their uh, provincial um, jurisprudence exam. So again, it's something you want to do a little bit of research on and kind of figure out how those boards are administered. But again, very, very important two things, graduation rate, look for schools that have high graduation rates and high board passage rates. And then the way our program is structured, um, it's a little bit different if you're if you're in college right now and you're on a semester system. Um, the trimester is a little bit different in the fact that um, our students go to school for 15 weeks. They have about a two to three week break and then they come back to school. So academically, excuse me, this is a five year program, but our students finish it in three and a third years or 40 months because technically they're going to school year round because the break periods are shorter. Um, and again, most of the students that get into the trimester system actually prefer it because of the type of information that you're you're um, learning. Having these long break periods are not going to help because you're going to not remember it and then you're going to have to come back and kind of learn things all over again where you know you have these shorter break periods. You just kind of and everything within the program kind of builds upon itself. So having these shorter breaks actually works much better. And then one of the other big benefits to this too is 
because you're finishing this program in three and a third years as opposed, let's say, four or five, um, you're out working and practicing that much sooner. So the way it's set up is the first year, uh, trimesters one through three, focus pretty much on basic science courses. Um, once you complete that, you transition into the second year, uh, which are trimesters four through six, which we call the chiropractic sciences. So this is where you kind of start learning how to become a doctor. So you start learning how to do your physical exam, um, you know, your diagnosis and treatment plan. You learn things like x-rays and how to read the film. You learn about CAT scans and MRIs. But this is also where, and I almost equate it with a toolbox, you start learning different chiropractic techniques that you're then going to utilize in the third year. It's a little confusing. It's four trimesters, but it's considered the third year, but it's the clinical phase. So this is where you start patient care. But because you're still a student and you're not licensed yet, you're working under the license of a clinician but you're providing the care and you're managing the cases. So the way it's set up is in trimester seven and eight, you're actually on campus, the Montgomery Health Center. So here is a student intern, you're treating like staff, faculty, fellow students, people from the community. And then in trimesters nine and 10, you get to rotate some for the two, some different opportunities we kind of have throughout the United States. The nice thing is, you know, if you want, you can do as many of these as you like. So you can get some really diverse patient experiences if you do multiple rotations. And a lot of these you can see are kind of focused on certain patient populations. So like the, the Care St. Louis Health Mercy Hospital kind of focuses on the underserved and uninsured patient population. Paraquad uh, is a nonprofit that focuses on people with disabilities. We do work with the VA, the Veterans Administration. Uh, so we do provide chiropractic uh, care to military veterans and we have rotations all over the United States. Um, Scott Air Force Base, we treat active duty military personnel. Um, Maya Corps, a hospital setting that's kind of in the Midwest, Kansas, Missouri, and Texas. Um, so like I said, you can just see, and the other thing is too, in order to graduate from chiropractic program, you have to perform a minimum of 250 adjustments. So through these clinical experiences is where you meet the graduation requirement, but also, like I said, you can kind of focus in on certain patient populations if you want to do that um, or get diverse experiences if you do the multiple rotations. And then as far as the techniques are concerned, um, there are a lot of different chiropractic techniques. So what we do at Logan is we teach what we call the core. So all the students learn the core techniques, which is Logan Basic, Diversified, Activator, and if you're not familiar with Activator, it's kind of an instrument aided adjustment. It's almost like a little spring loaded cylinder. It provides a very gentle but very specific adjustment. It's very, very good for like babies, pregnant women, children, the elderly patient. Uh, myofascial kind of soft tissue techniques. But then you also have the opportunity to learn different chiropractic techniques through electives. And again, a lot of students will do these based on maybe potential patient populations they may want to treat when they're in practice or just kind of based on interest. So again, you could expand on activator if you wanted to kind of work with that, you know, the babies, children, elderly patient. Um, there's techniques here like advanced diversified, applied kinesiology, maybe you want to work with athletes. Um, if you look down towards the bottom, you see the word acupuncture. Um, so in here in the United States, again, back to scope of practice, if you have the training you can perform acupuncture on your patients. So we teach it in our program. But like here in New York State, where I am, for example, if you want to perform acupuncture on your patients, you actually have to have a whole separate master's degree. So again, scope of practice can be a little bit different. But if you have an interest in acupuncture, you can take that through us and, you know, depending on the state you're in, incorporate acupuncture in your chiropractic practice. And then as far as the programs are concerned, um, the chiropractic program is our largest. Uh, currently, we have about 850 students enrolled in the chiropractic program. We do offer several online master's degrees. You can see things like applied nutrition and dietetics. Uh, the two in the middle, the nutrition and human performance, sports science and rehab, those two actually can be done concurrently with the chiropractic program. So it's not unusual for a student to actually graduate with more than one degree, chiropractic degree and a master's degree. And again, a lot of times students will do these based on areas of interest. We do offer a doctorate degree and uh, it's more focused on education for people that may wanna teach, let's say, I don't know, anatomy and physiology at the undergraduate level. And then in a little over a year from now, we're actually starting a PA program, a physician's assistant program as well, which we think will be a good kind of complement to the other programs that we offer at Logan.
Okay. So let me just really quickly, because I think this is might be a section where some of you, you know, wanted to learn more about us, which is the kind of the admissions requirements. So in order to be admitted into our program, uh, the minimum prerequisite GPA is a 3.0. So for those of you that are international that might not be on the 3.0 system, that would be like the equivalent of a B, a grade of a B, 4.0 would be an A. Um, we also require 24 credits of what we term a life physical or movement science. So we tend to have a lot of students that apply to our program. They're like exercise science, kinesiology, exercise physiology majors. And they tend to have a lot of the movement science um, courses, but you know we have biology majors, chemistry majors, pre-med, pre-health, allied health. So we, you know, we see people with all different types of backgrounds. Um, so one of the things that Jeremy and I and the other staff at Logan will do is if somebody's potentially interested in the program and wants to make sure they're qualified before they apply, you can actually send us an unofficial copy of your transcript and we'll go through it and do the evaluation, um, you know, calculate the, the prerequisite GPA, make sure you have enough credits. And then if you do decide, if you're qualified and decide you want to apply, we can kind of work with you through the application process. And then just to give you an idea, so um, life sciences are pretty much any like biology course you may take. Physical sciences, chemistry can be anything from general chem, organic, biochem, nutrition courses. Again, physics, pretty straightforward what that is. And then as I mentioned a minute ago with the movement sciences, you know, again, we see a lot of courses in like exercise science, exercise phys, kinesi uh, kinesiology, biomechanics. And then, hey, who's that guy in the middle? That looks like Jeremy. So the way the admissions process works, um, we're a little bit unique in the fact because we're on trimesters, we actually start class three times a year as opposed to two. So we have starts in January, May, and September. Um, applicant will apply online at our website. And then in addition to the application, they submit a statement of motivation, official transcripts, and then in this case, one letter of recommendation from a chiropractor. So this is another thing that sometimes students can be a little bit of a hurdle that we can help with. Um, I talked to gosh, three, 4,000 students a year. And those that have maybe have an interest in chiropractic, um, many of them, this is kind of new, so they don't have much background in it. So if they're interested in shadowing a chiropractor and they don't know one, um, we can help with that. And, and shadowing is probably one of the most important things you can do when you're looking at a career choice, because you have to look at things from this perspective. You're looking at a potential career here for the next 30 or 40 years of your life. And the last thing you want to do is be stuck in a career where you're miserable and you hate your job. So shadowing gives you a really good chance to kind of expose yourself to the profession, talk to the practitioner, and, you know, if they're running their own practice, talk to them about that and just get a really good feel for the profession. And if you're not sure, let's say you're thinking maybe you want to be a chiropractor, maybe you want to be a physical therapist, maybe be a medical doctor. Go shadow them all because you're going to know in your gut, yep, this is really what I see myself doing. So as I said, you know, if, if there's an interest in shadowing a chiropractor, you don't know one, depending on where you're from, you know, we have a alum all over the globe. We can help set that up for you if possible. Um, and then the other thing we do is we highly encourage people to come to campus for a visit. Um, and I, again, I think that's a very important step because, again, you want to make sure you're at a, you're at a place where you're comfortable. And just a little tip, I would tell you, um, if you go to a school uh, to visit, if it's at all possible, ask them if you can talk to students. You know, in my opinion, students are the best salespeople for a school because they're going to tell you the good and they're going to tell you the bad and kind of everything in between. So see if you can do that. Like if you come to visit Logan, you go on a tour, you go on tour with a student. You can sit on classes if you like. You can talk to faculty, go check out the health center, go check out St. Louis and Chesterfield. Because again, at the end of the day, you want to make sure you're at a school and at a location where you're going to be comfortable because that's really going to help your success academically. Um, so what we will do, and I, I know most of you are international or all international students, we will help bring you to campus. So we typically will reimburse for the cost of a flight. We'll put you up at a hotel for a couple of nights because we really think it's that important that people come to visit before they make the decision to attend. Um, so again, it, it's hugely important. And then um, I did wanna just mention real quickly, we do, uh, we call them future leopards weekends. 
currently these are kind of our open houses we do typically we do three a year we do one in march one in june and one in october so we just had one a couple months or last month in march the next one is june 15th then we have another um, october 21st these are bigger events um, like the one in march i think we had almost 60 prospective students there with their parents um you know again we have the ones coming up in june and october we also do visits on fridays or are much smaller a little bit more intimate so if somebody just wanted to come with their parents they could do that either way um, we will help bring you to campus with the, the flight reimbursement in the hotel. And then lastly, this is, um, I, I, you probably already have it, but um, it's my contact information. Um, what you may wanna do is maybe write this down or maybe even take a picture of it with your phone. Um, because if at some point, um, you know, you have questions about the presentation, you know, you want me to look at your transcript, you want to come to visit, you want to shadow a chiropractor, any of those type of things, you can reach out to me, I can help with that. And then when we come back, uh, Jeremy, I'm sure can put his contact information in the chat box as well. Okay, so that's everything I had. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to stop the share. And I'm going to come back. Oop. Okay. <coughs> so I've kind of gone through the presentation itself. So at this point, um, are there any questions you might have for Jeremy or myself? Um, yeah, so thanks very much. We do have some questions from folks uh, when they signed up. And if anyone has other questions, um, feel free to fire them into the chat. We'll take them one by one. And then I've got a couple myself from having listened in. So let's start with the student questions if we can. Um, first one is pretty general. Any tips for applying to the USA as a Canadian student? Um, what should students be on the lookout for? Caveats to watch out for? Any advice that you have? Okay. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay. So as your on campus, um, uh, a representative or a coordinator that'll be working directly with you. Uh, there are a couple things to just kind of be mindful of um, because I, be, I believe a lot of you, if not all of you, would be considered international students. You wouldn't qualify for federal aid. OK, and of course, the financial aspect would be a larger aspect, you know, or something to kind of think about it uh, and prepare for as you're getting ready for to start here at Logan University. OK, so Michael went through the application process in terms of what you need. OK, so once you've become accepted and let's say you you solidify your spot, uh, there's a tuition deposit uh, that is due first and foremost to solidify your spot. And once you solidify your spot, then it becomes all right. How do we prepare you prepare prepare you for your transition from where you are to uh, to campus, you know, and making sure everything is good to go in terms of that. So how that works is we require students to show us um, that they have access to a certain amount uh, of money that to show that they are, are able to afford not only just tuition, but living expenses for and books and supplies for at least a year into the program for 12 months. OK, once you're able to showcase that you have that, and send us a uh, a passport photo or a picture of your uh, passport photo page, then I would be able to go in and issue you your I-20, okay, which is your student visa in order to um, come into the, the states to study, okay? So that would be the biggest thing that you would have to prepare for is that financial, financial act and making sure all of those funds are taken care of. Now, these don't have to be directly your funds, but it just has to, just has to show you have access to it. So it can be a parent, it can be a friend, but as long as we get that that uh, paperwork from the bank showing that you have access to this, then we can move forward with issuing you, issuing you your I-20 to start classes here. So just to clarify, Jeremy, I'm curious, it's mm -hmm. you folks at the school who offer the, the study permit, essentially, it doesn't come from like the feds, it comes from, from you folks directly? Yeah, so so going a little bit more into detail with this. So we have uh, we get approval from the uh, from Stevis 
or from the student and exchange visitor program well, there's a uh now getting into the like some of the forms of everything so there's an i-17 form and we get approval from the uscis to be a school that has designated school officials or a principal uh, designated school officials to be able to issue those I-20. So yes, we can do that. Now there's still a portion of the process that has to go through um, the USCIS, but yes, we can issue the initial I-20 um, for us to be able to start here in the program. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, kind of different from how we have it set up in Canada and probably more convenient from the student point of view. So that is the school here. <laughs> Uh, so you mentioned the financial requirement, of course. We had something similar here as well. Um, one question we got kind of goes to that, and I looked it up myself to confirm, um, but that is using provincial student loan programs here in Canada, in Ontario, the most popular one, of course, is OSAP. Mm -hmm. um, do you know, are you set up to essentially accept student loans from different provinces here in Canada. Yes, we are. We are. Uh, OSAP is one of the more popular, uh, or actually is, is the the one that we get <laughs> for the most part. Uh, so yes, we are familiar with OSAP. Usually how the process goes is once, the, once they speak or once they initiate the process, they will then need um, some documents filled out from us and our university. Of course, stating like some different living expenses and things like that cost the program just break some cost breakdowns that we will fill out or our financial aid department fills out and sends it back to the student to send to osap and then a lot of times our students are able to get it improved approved uh that way so yes we are familiar with with osap one other cool. thing i want to mention too is as an international student you automatically qualify for um a scholarship hmm. there's no uh, require for, requirement for it initially, you automatically qualify for a $20,000 scholarship, which breaks down to $2,000 per trimester. And now you automatically qualify for it in the beginning, but in order to maintain that scholarship, you have to have at least a 3.0 cumulative GPA uh, throughout the program, which like Michael said earlier is like a B average. Yeah, so that's quite generous and not um an unmanageable threshold. Uh, the question that we always get from students around these kind of things are uh, what happens if I have a bad month? You know, my parents are knocked out of the picture or whatever. And is there a way I can sort of appeal for uh, if I slip below that B average? Yeah, so that's usually like a one trimester grace period. OK, so you usually have, have that grace period to get your GPA back to that point. And a lot of times that's also why it's a cumulative GPA, uh, because it's based off of just your total weight and not just one one um, struggling trimester, so to speak. So so yes, uh, they, students typically have a grace, a grace trimester to kind of get their GPA back up to that mark of what the requirement is. Nice. Yeah, that makes sense. Um... We just always always get that follow up question. Uh, sure. How about then cost of living? Um, I'm speaking from downtown Toronto perspective, which is out of control um, across Canada, <laughs> so it does vary. But I'm curious if you can speak to general sort of cost of living expectations for somebody who might be coming from Canada to Missouri. Yes. Yeah, so um, now, of course, it's it's. Um, I guess I'll just get right into like the money because a lot of this is really relative to where you're from, what you're used to, how much you're used to paying. Uh, so closer to the university, uh, it's in, like I said, in the suburb area of the St. Louis area, one of the nicest areas here um, and the areas surrounding the school are, are very nice. So it's a little bit more expensive in comparison to places that are closer down to the city or some other areas in the St. Louis area. But um, for a one bedroom by yourself, um, you're looking at anywhere between nine hundred to twelve hundred dollars per month for rent. OK, nice. um, cool. so Pretty that good. is essentially what you're looking at there. Um, but a lot of our students, they decide to go the roommate route. Now, if you decide to go get a roommate and let's say you get a two bedroom still close to the to the uh, university and in the area, you can almost cut their cost in half. You can be paying anywhere from, I would say, 600 to 
I would say six to seven or eight hundred dollars a month in in rent. You know, so it really just depends on what you're looking for, what your cost breakdown is, what you're wanting to pay, um, and that's kind of what that looks like. But yes, that's what the the cost breakdown uh, traditionally is, and it kind of ranges from there. Now you can always find something more expensive, but for a college student, that's usually the range you'll you'll stay in. That's uh, pretty appealing to me, I'll tell you that much. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we've got a couple of other questions. We're kind of running tight on time, but I think we can sneak them in. One uh, very specific about undergrad programs in health sciences. I know we talked a bit about some master's stuff. Is there much at the undergrad level or is it primarily sort of professional level? So we have two undergraduate programs. One is in life science and one is in human biology. OK, so they both uh, related to the science. Now, the human biology program, that's a full undergraduate degree in itself. Um, a lot of our students that that go that route, they traditionally want to pursue uh, uh, another career of some sort. Uh, maybe they want to go into uh, go or become a medical doctor or go into another field. But the life science program is designed specifically for students that want to go into our chiropractic program. OK, mm -hmm. and it's also a way for students to speed up the process. So, for example, instead of finishing up your full undergraduate degree and getting that bachelor's degree, you will get um, the I guess you can say the minimum requirements for the chiropractic purpose. So you will get a uh, 90 total hours, and you'll go get that 24 hours of life or physical science courses. Uh, of course, you have to maintain a GPA, and then you'll start the chiropractic program from that from that point. After your first year of the chiropractic program, your you will then receive your bachelor's degree while already have starting the chiropractic program. So you'll pretty much sh shave off a year of school by going the life science route, if that's something that you know you would like to do and, and ultimately decide. But yes, those are the two undergraduate programs that we have as of now. Appreciate the clarity, thank you. And I mm -hmm. hope that uh, helps answer the question of whatever that was that asked it. Um, I've got one or two more here. Um, one is kind of uh, follow up to something, Michael, that you had mentioned, which was, uh, one of the best ways to get to know a school is to get to know the students. And I'm just curious, outside of the open house that you mentioned, June, October, uh, is there any ways you would recommend, um, you know, Canadians or whomever try to get in touch with Logan U students? <laughs> Absolutely. So again, it's another part of Jeremy and myself, our job is we kind of try to help with these things. So um, I, I do this all the time with the students that I meet. You know, if they have an interest in potentially have an interest in Logan, I I highly encourage them to talk to students. And I we kind of have these student ambassadors that work for us mm -hmm. um, that are in school. And I have other students that I've kind of helped come to Logan that are more than happy to talk to prospective students um, or faculty even. So it, it's it's a great opportunity because you get to. You, get to hear about the day to day from somebody that's going through it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think what most of the students will tell a prospective student is, you know, academically, our students are very well prepared. The big kind of a, pardon the pun, adjustment they have to make is um, just the workload. Cause you're going from making, taking 15, 18 credits a semester to like a, our first try is what? 26 credits, Jeremy, 25, 26 credits. It's uh, tw 24 actually, 24, okay, 24. but then it goes up from there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's some trimesters where we're taking close to 30 credits. So yeah. but ju just to be able to talk to somebody and have them tell you that it's, it's doable. Um, you know, it's, it's just, there's kind of a, almost like a, a system you get into, you know, kind of a day to day flow just to hear that from somebody who's gone through it can be really helpful. So if anybody has an interest in talking to a student, you can reach out to me and Jeremy at any time. Very cool. Thanks. Definitely got me wondering about my own back here thinking I could probably use some TLC. <laughs> um, anything else on your fellow's minds before we kind of let you go? Any uh, parting words of wisdom as it were? Just like I said, if if there's anything you have for either, you know, we're we're available anytime. If you need anything from us, just feel free to to reach out. 
Yeah, and I, and I would focus on the one aspect that I doubt that you mentioned earlier too, Mike, was there are alternatives to, um, you know, the basic admissions requirements. So if you all yeah. if you all have any like um, questions about if you qualify, if you don't qualify, reach out to us. We'll be more than willing uh, to help and see where you stand and talk through uh, possibilities of what we can do moving forward or you know what you already have and how we can make that work so please if you have any questions about that reach out to us and we'll be happy to help beauty uh thanks for those really do appreciate your time the expertise feel like i've learned a few things uh the recording will be available we'll share it around and otherwise have a great evening thanks so, so much for joining us everybody thank you absolutely thank you good night yeah. everybody